I'd like to direct your attention this evening to something that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. And if you don't know that reference by heart already, which I imagine many of you do, I'll let you guess what it is that he says that we're going to look at. Um, if you've ever studied the book of 1 Corinthians, then you know it's a hard book to study through. And it's not challenging because the topics are, are particularly complex. They aren't. There are a couple of verses that are um, challenging, by and large. It's not a hard book to understand. What makes it challenging is all of the sin and conflict that's going on in the church. Um, Paul writes the letter because he's learned of all of it, and he, he needs to do something about it. It's a very emotional letter. In chapter 15, he comes to the matter of the resurrection. And some of the ways in which the saints at Corinth have abandoned Jesus' teaching on the subject for the beliefs of those around them. So he says this in verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. The English standard says, wake up from your drunken stupor. I think some of yours will talk about being sober-minded. Uh, come to your senses, is the way one puts it. I like that idea. As is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Bad company ruins good morals. You know that quote quite well, I imagine. Um, matter of fact, your Bible may even put that statement in quotes. As you can see, it does in this version on the screen. It does so because it seems to have been coined from a Greek playwright who lived about 300 years before Paul did. And by Paul's time, it had become every bit as much a maxim as it is still in our day. And the reason is, is obvious. It's true. It's a true statement. Bad company corrupts good morals. As a matter of fact, that Greek proverb, if you will, carries much the same effect as a Jewish proverb that Paul cites earlier in the letter, as a matter of fact, we just happened to read in the um, scripture reading from a different location there in Galatians, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's much the same idea. So this verse is one that, of course, naturally finds its way into Bible studies with young people. Parents and class teachers have cited this particular verse countless times talking with their teens about the friends that they make who they spend their time with. I want you to notice, though, when Paul writes this, he's speaking to the entire Corinthian congregation, and primarily, given the issue, the adults. He has said this to them as he's trying to address a problem there in Corinth that is altogether an adult problem. You have grown Christians in the Corinthian church that need to be reminded Bad company can ruin good morals. So I'll just go ahead and take the game plan for this evening. We are going to quickly get an idea of the particular problem that Paul's trying to sort out and the role that bad company was playing in the matter. Then we're going to consider what it is that Paul says in order to set things right. And then finally we're going to talk about the harm that bad company can, can bring to us. Back in uh, verse 12, Paul said, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So you've got some of the members of the church of Corinth that are denying in principle that something like your body being raised from the dead could ever happen. And since a major tenet of the gospel is that Jesus' body was raised from the dead, and that one day he's going to return and there will be a resurrection of all the dead to either eternal life or eternal judgment, to have some of the Christians in Corinth deny it is a big issue. So I don't know how exactly they made peace with all of this, how they continued to call themselves Christians and yet came to grips with the fact that they were discarding something quite central to Christianity, but somehow some of them had and a part of the problem in chapter 15 is the same two factors that contribute to nearly every problem in the book. First of all, them continuing to be influenced by the world around them. 
And then second, failing to realize just how much that was happening. I think it's worth taking a couple of minutes to just explain why on earth would the, the Corinthian Christians ever deny the resurrection to begin with? If you think about it, it's quite central to Christianity. It has everything to do with the hope that we hold and, and the day that we're waiting for. So why would somebody deny it? Well, certainly one reason for this problem, as with all the rest in the letter that Paul has to address, was the Greek culture around it. So the Stoics and the Epicureans of their time denied flat out that there would ever one day be something so silly as a bodily resurrection. Meanwhile, Christianity affirms it blatantly. So the Greeks called that foolishness, this idea of a, of a future resurrection of the dead. And they weren't the only ones to deny that, as you know, back even before the time of Jesus with the Jewish Sadducees. They ridiculed the idea of a resurrection, and the Greeks mocked the idea too. Part of the reason that the Greeks denied it is because their idea of a bodily resurrection and God's idea of a bodily resurrection were dramatically different. So to the Greek way of thinking, the body is frail. Yes, it is. And there are very few that somehow find a way to die young and strong and also whole. So who wants to have their spirit cast back into the shackles of age and pain and injury and frailty and then take those things with them into the afterlife? That was their idea. Now that might seem kind of bizarre to us, but there's a lot about the resurrection that, that has been revealed to us and we just kind of take our understanding of it for granted sometimes. Which is not to mention the fact that as, as far as the Greeks were concerned, not only did they have a odd idea of the resurrection, the wrong idea, but also as far as they're concerned, nobody has ever seen somebody who's dying come back to life. But that's not actually true. People by that time had seen people come back to life, even before the time of Jesus. As far as the Greeks are concerned, they have. So the resurrection is just silly to the people of Corinth. And even though the Corinthians to whom Paul is writing were Christians who had accepted the good news that Jesus is king and put their faith in him, nevertheless, they're still in many ways a product and a part of their culture. Every Christian brings with them the baggage of their culture and their upbringing, and the Corinthians did that as well. The thinking they'd grown up with, the worldview they'd formed, the friends they'd grown up with, and the influences that gathered around themselves. So, now, even though they're not giving up Christianity, at least as far as they're concerned, they are denying a major component of Jesus' teaching, major claims that their own king had made. It may also be that there was an additional factor at play here, and that may just be simply their own sinful desires and lusts. Uh, if you recall back in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, you remember there are those who believed, as, as many Greeks did, that the physical body and the spiritual soul within were completely separate. Which meant you could commit sins with your body. Like fornication, you could engage in the, the social activities all associated with the local worship of idols, the frequenting of temple priestesses that you see in chapter 6, the, the eating of the meats and things that are offered to the idols as you see later on in 8 and following. You can spend your physical life right in the middle of everything that you're supposed to have left behind. And none of that matters because you are just simply giving the body what it means. Remember the, the food is meant for the body and the body is meant for food was their kind of line of, of thinking in, in 1 Corinthians 6. But meanwhile, your mind and your heart belong to the Lord, so everything's okay. And there's going to come a day when the material becomes immaterial. And then the spirit, your psyche, is going to be all that remains and it will be utterly unmarred by any of the acts of the flesh. However, if on the other hand, the physical body is not to be simply cast off, but instead it's going to be raised and transformed. Then it matters. And it has value. And you don't have that same 
unbreachable separation between the spiritual and the material, and now you have to consider what it is that you do in your body. Which is something Paul addresses back in chapter 6, what you do in the body matters. Remember the food is made from the stomach, and the stomach is made from food, meaning we're just using our bodies for what they're there for. And God says, or Paul says, no, God made your body. And he didn't make it for stuff like that. So, for whatever reason or reasons, you have some of the Corinthians denying the resurrection. And Paul responds to that, and it takes up pretty much all of chapter 15. To sum that up very quickly, first things first, if it is true that someone cannot be raised from the dead, if just in principle that sort of thing is not possible, then even the resurrection of Jesus is not possible. And Paul asks them, do you realize the implications of this new belief of yours? To take this position means you have to reject one of the most fundamental things I've ever taught you. He says in verse 3, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received from the Lord Himself, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried and then he was raised on the third day again in accordance with the scriptures. You're not just denying what Jesus said and what I'm teaching you, but also what the scriptures said would happen. And then after that, he appeared to hundreds of brethren. And Paul says that is one of the first things I ever taught you because everything hinges on that. And if resurrection is just a foolish notion, then everything you've ever been taught about Jesus is a lie. And he says there in verse 12, he says, you guys need to understand, once you tip over this domino, all the rest go with it. So verse 12, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and moreover, your faith is in vain. And then along with that, you got a few more implications. Verse 15, we are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that He raised Christ, and He didn't raise Him if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. He reiterates that point. And then it just keeps going. Verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. And then verse 18, if Christ has not been raised, then those who fall asleep in Christ, they just simply perish. Those who died in Him have just died. That's it. So you've just got this cascade of ramifications if you deny the resurrection. I haven't really thought that through. In verse 35, what Paul does is address a concern that, that, that they've uh, been worried about over what becomes of the body in the resurrection, if there is such a thing. So read this with me very quickly. He says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? He says, you foolish person. What you sow does not come back to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps a wheat or some other grain. So just for example, it's a seed. But God gives it a body as He has chosen, and to each kind of seed, He gives it its own body. For not all flesh is the same. For there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. And then He looks beyond. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There's one glory of the sun, there's another glory of the moon, there's another glory of the stars, and even star differs from star in glory. The point is, <laughs> all the different bodies that God has made, all the different animals, all the different fish, all the different birds, all the different plants that first exist as a seed and then become something else entirely, then you think of all the different heavenly bodies. And then the earthly bodies, to look at the geography of this earth, but then to look to the heavens and see all there is to behold. He says, and not even star differs from star. So many different bodies that God has made, each one of them fit for its purpose and environment, and you're worried about your body in the resurrection? Paul says, it's foolish 
that you're thinking in this way? Why are you worried about that? He's made the point about seeds that vary and then become a different form. And he says in verse 42, that just like that seed that you bury, it turns into something completely different. Paul says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. You bury a body that's perishable. But what is raised will be imperishable. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown in natural body, it's raised in spiritual body. What are you worried about? And where are you getting your ideas from? Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. A bad company um, corrupts, or uh, what should I say, um, tears down strong faith. Bad company corrupts good theology. Wake up from your drunken stupor. Return to your senses, as is right. Do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad company corrupts. And Paul doesn't say this to a teenage class that's wrestling with peer pressure. That's a really good point to make in that kind of a setting, but that's not what Paul is doing. He says this to grown Christians who are being influenced by people around them failing to realize the implication of what they're doing. That they are following this influence away from some of the most fundamental teachings of Jesus. And the reason some of the Corinthian Christians have begun to deny this fundamental teaching of the resurrection of the dead is because of the company they're keeping. They have friends who are in the world who have bought into all the philosophies of their day who do not have knowledge of God and His power, and who can easily corrupt the faith and morals of these naive Christians. So the keeping a company with pagans has affected their thinking about this fundamental doctrine and allowed them to think, I can reject this one teaching of Christianity and still be a Christian and that'll be fine. It's not that big a deal. The Lord will still accept me. It doesn't literally unravel everything. Paul is rather emphatic. No, it does not work that way. Don't be deceived. You've been fooled. Bad company ruins good morals. You need to wake up, stop sinning, and, and, and um, appreciate that there are those who have no knowledge. May I suggest to you that we do not have enough time in the remainder of this service, let alone the remainder of the day, to talk about all the countless ways in which you and I are susceptible to this exact same sort of thing. All the forms that this danger of, of our good morals being ruined by bad company can take for us today. So just to give you an idea, think of all the differences between the teachings of Jesus and the beliefs of the average 21st century American. Or think of all the differences in the teachings of Jesus and, all, and the beliefs of even the average 21st century American who professes to be a Christian. And at every single one of those points lies the exact same potential for corruption. And that danger of exchanging the truth for a lie and denying what Jesus and his apostles have taught for the beliefs of those who have no knowledge of God or who don't have enough knowledge of him. When I think back to my time in grade school, you know, talk about this passage being something that was used when, when you're young. Um, I think back to the temptations that I had to face. And maybe that temptation, you might say, to go along to get along. You want to be like your friends. You want to do what they do. Some of it was like fun, you just want to be part of it. You don't want to miss out. And you not necessarily want to stand out. But aside from that, I don't know how things work for you all, but you know what I had to avoid in grade school? Drugs, alcohol, filthy language, and moral activities. That's about it. I didn't have to deal with those things and also have progressive values shoved in my face every moment of the day. I wasn't surrounded 
my teachers and friends continually telling me that homosexuality is love like any other love, that gender is a social construct, and that to say what the Bible says is sin is to be hateful. I didn't have all that around me, and frequently, so as to get used to it and start compromising with God's standards and adopt the world's. But I have friends who did. And I have friends who left the Lord's church so that they could find a church where homosexuality was accepted. Where gender fluidity is accepted. Bad company corrupting good morals. And here they were deceived into thinking, well, I can just reject this one aspect of Jesus' teaching and still somehow be a Christian. Um, I imagine you'll sympathize with this feeling quite a lot. It's kind of sad, isn't it? To miss the days when the main things people would leave the Lord's Church for was either wanting to maybe have more entertainment or just want to do their own thing or wanting to continue on perhaps in adultery and still be accepted. Like, those were the days. Right? It's kind of sad. Bad company corrupts good morals. And there is so much bad these days that pitfalls are scattered about like a minefield. So if your thinking ever begins to change on something, it is important to take a moment and examine why. It is true that, that whether you are young, especially in that case, or whether you are not, you will never stop learning. And you always have more left to learn, things to consider that you've not considered before. So your thinking is going to do a lot of changing and developing and maturing over the years. But especially if you notice a shift in your thinking with regard to something you've previously believed God's Word says. Or something to do with what God says is right or wrong. If your thinking on those things begins to change, you need to examine why. Is it because of a deeper study of the Scriptures? Okay then. Or is it because of the company you keep? There is, of course, nothing wrong in hearing what someone who would challenge your beliefs has to say. Nothing wrong in considering the challenge that they may pose to your beliefs. You and I are in a search for the truth, are we not? Someone once said, truth, if it is truth, can withstand the closest scrutiny. And after all, when we go to somebody who we believe is not following the Bible correctly, we are asking them to examine with scrutiny their very beliefs, and it's not very uh, honest to not be willing to do the same. But as Paul said, don't be deceived. Which means don't change your mind on something in the Bible because you want to. Change it only when you have to. Because Scripture forces it. Because deeper study and more knowledge of God has shown you that your previous conclusion was wrong. You never want to change your belief because of those who have no knowledge of God. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And there's your safeguard. So if, if people lacking a knowledge of, of, of God could corrupt the Corinthians such that they didn't even realize they were denying a fundamental tenet of Christianity. If they can be corrupted, so can I. So then that begs the question of who do I spend my time with? Because those are going to be the kind of people who are going to have the, the most impact on me, be it for good or for bad. And sometimes the impact that they have isn't nearly as overt as the previous examples that we were citing. For example, maybe it's their temperament. Their temperament. Proverbs 22, verse 24. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angry. Or you may learn their ways and meet yourself easily. My friends are regularly impatient and regularly angry about things and regularly rude to others. It's going to rub off. 
Philippians 4, verse 5 says we're supposed to let our reasonableness, or your version may say gentleness, be known to everyone. That's how we're supposed to be. There's some people that aren't very gentle. We need to spend the majority of our time with people like that. Or the uh, corrupting influence may come from our uh, friend's maturity or lack thereof. Proverbs 13 and verse 20 and then 14 and verse 7. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And then 14, 7, leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not need words of knowledge. It may be just in general their outlook on life. So we have Paul quoting a secular proverb. I'll give you one too. Everybody's heard the phrase, misery loves company. Right? If I spend my time with a person who's given to negativity, before too long I will be too. It is, of course, godly to provide a shoulder to cry on. It is right to provide an ear to listen to their concerns. But... Proverbs 15 and verse 13 says, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. And sometimes it's odd, but have you ever known someone who seemed addicted to being sorrowful? Addicted to being in a bad mood? I've known a few people that the way it struck me was that they didn't feel grounded in life unless they had the weight of the world on their shoulders. From the outside, it seems like they refuse to be happy. I know from the inside, it can often be much more complicated. But that can easily affect me. And so I do need to help them. I need to be, and we're not going to have time in this lesson to talk about it, I need to be the good companion that builds good morals. And I need to be the counterbalance and lift them up. Maybe I need to do that in carefully measured doses. Step away after the while. Philippians 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord. The Lord's at hand. Do not be anxious. Pray. And I need to be the example for that instead of being influenced in the other direction. I think sometimes we just choose for ourselves companions who are ultimately worldly. And they're comfortable with that. Uh, the religion really doesn't mean anything to them. Maybe they had a faith when they were kids and made it grow, but, but now they're just, just people of the world. Uh, they're going to go out on the boat, if they're going to go golfing, they're going to go drinking. I uh, have family doing all my thing. Um, can't look at anything on their Facebook because it's always them out on the boat wearing what they wear and drinking what they drink. Just, just nonsense. You, you can surround yourself with people like that. And they might tone it down a little bit when you're around, but it still shows love. And they'll have a very earthy or earthly worldview, and it just permeates their character, their thinking, their speech. But in contrast, our worldview is supposed to be quite different. Again, Philippians 4. Brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, right, and righteous, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So you are what you think about, and you think about what and who you spend your time with. Um, I think it was right around the turn of the millennium the Harry Potter books started coming out, and I was in college. And, my college roommate kept trying to get me to read them. I'm like, they're kids' books, man. I'm not going to do it. Um, but in the summer of 2011, I finally gave in, and I, I read them. I'll, I'll put air quotes around that. I, I like audio books. I, I'll pop one of those going on. I'll have one of those going whenever I'm driving anywhere. So I listened to all seven in a row about as fast as I could in one summer because they hooked me that much. Um, and they are read by a narrator with a lovely English voice. Can I tell you, there are still Britishisms I can't get out of my vocabulary that weren't in my vocabulary before that summer. Um, I spent most of my childhood in southern Georgia and western Kentucky. Both places have a particular way of talking. But in my 20s, 
and in my early 30s, I spent one week every year for 10 years as a counselor at the Florida College Camp in New Jersey. And I have never said coffee the same. I don't even know how we said coffee back in Kentucky. I think coffee, but I'm not sure. You pick up what you spend your time with. And if that's bad company with bad morals, or it's progressive company with progressive morals, or it's cranky company with cranky morals, or immature company, or selfish company, or don't know their Bible but think they do company, that's what you're going to pick up too. Who do I go to when I need help? When I need advice for life, I need to talk about my problems, who do I go to? Proverbs 1 verse 7, I know you know this verse, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fearing God. That is knowledge 101. That, that's step number one. That's the foundation. So if I seek counsel from someone for help with my problems, and I go to people who don't start with the fundamental understanding that God is all in all, Christ is king, everything rests on what Jesus says about something, do I really think that person is the best one to talk to? And I will say, I realize sometimes what we may need help with unfortunately goes beyond the capabilities of our brethren to, to advise us. Um, if any of you have ever had cause, perhaps for um, trauma, PTSD, a um, variety of different things all in that neighborhood, if you've ever caught, had cause to, to speak with a counselor or a therapist on those things, um, it seems to be the case that in the same way, you know, my brethren are great, but I don't go to them when I got a broken leg, that those things kind of step out of the experience of a lot of Christians. Not always. Sometimes it does. And sometimes it helps to go to a um, doctor of those things. And sometimes that's about all you can do to help with that particular thing. I would say, as far as the advice goes, obviously you never leave behind prayer. You never leave behind what God says about how to live your life. But sometimes that's just very helpful. Um, if that is the case, it's quite important to find someone who at the very least is a, is a professed Christian. I differ with them on theology, but I need to know that, that their faith, as they understand it, is important to them. Because I need them to understand, if they have some tenet of philosophy, ironically from the Stoics and the Epicureans and things like that, that runs roughshod against the will of God, it gets left behind, and the will of God takes precedent. And you can find uh, counselors like that. But then once you do, you got to keep those ears open. Because sometimes that advice is, is, is going to be, you might not catch it when it starts to push towards worldly counsel instead of godly counsel. But I understand that sometimes that is necessary. Really more of what I'm talking about is, is when we go to our friends with what we're dealing with. We go to them for advice. And maybe they are Christian, maybe they aren't. But they're my friend. I understand. And they love me. I don't doubt it. They've always been there for me. Thankful I have friends like that too. They want what's best for me. That's the problem. What if what they think is best is not what Jesus says is best? And they don't know the difference because they don't know the fear of the Lord. Not to mention, sometimes our friends will let us off the hook. Proverbs 15, verse 12 says, A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. Am I talking with people who have wisdom? Or people who will tell me what I want to hear? And then, I especially love what Hebrews 5 and verse 14 brings to this discussion. This is the passage of, by this point, brethren, you should be teachers already, but you have need to be taught the fundamental principles of the gospel again. You need milk and not solid food. Verse 14 is when he talks about those who are well versed in the scripture and who, in fact, are, are capable of being teachers to others. Listen to this and think about it in this context. 
solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Someone who has lived the Word of God in scenario after scenario and can tell you from experience how to go about it. You go to people like that. Can you imagine what a company like that can do for our morals and for our judgments and our choices and our temperament and our thinking? And all of that. So do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. And I say this to your shame. The Corinthians have reason to be ashamed. If they're so easily swayed from the teachings of Jesus by the thinking of their friends, they have reason to be ashamed. I don't know. But maybe you have cause to be ashamed too. Maybe it is that you have stored up God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him, that you might not be pulled aside by the, the thinkings of your companions. Maybe that the company you keep is, is making a ruin of what the word or what word of God is in your heart. And it's chipping away at your faith and all to your shame. If that's the case, then as Paul says, it's time to stop being deceived and wake up and stop sinning. Sometimes the, the company that we keep can, can keep faith from taking root to begin with. Someone who's not yet become a Christian because their, their worldly friends coupled with their own worldly desires keeps them, deceived and keeps them deceived and keeps them from a knowledge of God. It doesn't have to do that. You've got to persuade that person to wake up and do what's right. No longer go on sinning and come to a knowledge of God. And then you need to start by accepting matters of first importance. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. And on the third day, he rose. And you need to put your faith in him. You need to die to sin with him. You need to be buried with him in baptism so that one day you can be raised with him. And that's the message we need to take to people in those positions. But if perhaps you are in the former. And the uh, association <laughs> friends you've been spending time with lately have infiltrated your faith and begun to erode its foundation. I hope you'll repent of that, recommit yourself to the Lord, wake up, stop being deceived, stop sinning, and renew your knowledge of God. If we can encourage you in that regard, we would love the opportunity to stand. I find a passion to renounce the cross, and my heart cries with God.